Welcome to this session of Zero Hunger, Zero Waste, Supporting Innovation for a Sustainable Food System. Thank you to all of our virtual audience members for joining us today. We are glad to have you. And thank you to all of our panelists for being willing to share your valuable insights with us. Um, for part one of this discussion, we've invited experts to talk through the capital and innovation landscape. And later for part two, we will welcome several leading innovators into the conversation to share their perspectives. My name is Kelly Bryan. I lead the sustainability practice at Village Capital, and I have the honor of moderating both part one and part two of this session. So I'd like to start here by introducing each of our panelists for part one focused on capital and innovation. So I will do a round of, of brief introductions for everybody and then we'll get through into the conversation. So I'd like to start by introducing Alexandria Corey. She is Vice President of Capital Innovation and Engagement at ReFed. We also have Alexis Rosenswag, co-founder and venture partner at Rethink Food. Earthrin Cousins, president and co-founder of Food Systems for the Future. And Sunny Realhorn Parr, executive director for the Kroger Co. Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation. Thank you all for joining. So as we begin the discussion today, I think it's important to acknowledge the reality that food waste is rampant in America. The Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation, along with many other organizations, innovators, and change makers across the nation are working together to address a fundamental absurdity in our food system. 35% of food produced in the United States is thrown away, yet 50 million Americans struggle with hunger every day. And that includes an estimated 17 million children. I'd like to open up with a question here to the entire panel. What would it take to create a world without hunger, without food loss, and without food waste? And maybe more importantly, why is this problem important to you? Sunny, would you mind starting us off? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And thanks, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I think we would all agree that we need all the voices at the table, right? So speaking from the corporate philanthropy perspective on the panel today, um, we have to do a better job of continuously asking ourselves, who are the stakeholders that need to be a part of the conversation? Whose point of view and lived experience is missing when we make important decisions as capital providers and investment, um, you know, kind of analysts in this work? And why are they missing? And how do we develop our processes to make sure we're getting after filling that need and I think part of that process is the challenge on us and the need on us to ask hard questions, right? Like we need to educate ourselves to be brave enough to ask the hard questions that poke and provoke thoughtful reflection from the everyday experts, the solutions providers, so that we as capital and investment providers are making the decisions based on that information, right? So in my vision, go with me, I dream of a world where we can get a 10 block radius in a city or a 10 mile radius in the country and make sure that every person within that vicinity has access to three meals a day. And there is a place for all surplus food. And I think my, the, the vision there would be like to really truly test out that model and have it be refined based on kind of the local flavor, right? So from there, there are many pilots that could be tested. Like how might we blueprint the findings and share it with the world? I know that's like an ambitious vision, but I wanna share that with you as we kind of think about and set the tone for zero hunger, zero waste. And of course, every community has, uh, is gonna have its own unique nuances. But you know, that's, that's kind of how I think about our how might we when we think about a world with zero hunger and zero waste as a reflection of this um, conversation today. Why is it important to me? Um, I never imagined that I would be doing this work. And for me, it's not necessarily what brings me to the work and it's not necessarily my personal passion for the work. While all that is, you know, kind of bundled up in my everyday, um, it's the fact that I have, I have to recognize that I have the privilege to do the work. And I'm not 100% certain 
how I've got to this space and this place in leading philanthropy and social investments for the Zero Hunger Zero Waste Foundation of the Kroger Company. But I'm committed to bringing my entrepreneurial spirit and my drive to help start make small ripples that create lasting waves, um, that create lasting impressions for those who work deeply in the space. And for those who like me and who are on the panel um, today, you know, we have the privilege to work in this space. Um, I wanna share a little bit of my story and um, I think it will reflect a little bit about my experience and, and how I think about this work um, very actively. It's not, it's not subconscious either. So before I was born, I was malnourished. So before my first breath on the earth, right? The planet, I had already experienced mal malnutrition. Thusly, actually, I was born with a cleft lip and palate. And from my first days, I struggled with hunger. My biological mother and I were living off the land in a mountainside on the border of North Korea. And we struggled for about two and a half years together. And then I was abandoned and I struggled with hunger, bouncing from orphanage to orphanage and nutritional um, quality to my development in the most formative years, right? And we know all the uh, kind of childhood nutrition that, that happens in the very, very formative years of um, one's life. And I still have an open cleft palate. So like fast forward today and, and you're asking, you know, kind of the panelists and what we're bringing to this discussion. Um, I'm here because I was adopted by loving parents who afforded me the opportunities that I could not have had otherwise. And, um, yeah, there were many pit stops along the way, but I, I would say overall, I approach the work with humility and I bring my lived experience um, and, my, and my grit to survive. Um, and my goal is truly to bring my full self uh, to my work every single day. And my work today, because of privilege, um, brings me to imagining a world where we don't have when there is no hunger and every, every portion of food, right? And, and um, goes to its highest need, which is to feed humans. Sunny, thank you for sharing. I, um, I appreciate that perspective. And uh, Earthrin, I'm, I'm kind of curious from your background, right? As president right now of the Food Systems for Future, um, what do you think it's actually going to take and why is this important to you? Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate on such an important panel during a time when we are preparing for the UN Food System Summit, where we as a global community are working together to address just these very questions. And so to participate in the dialogue where we're thinking about these issues here in the United States, I, I feel very privileged. Uh, let me start by saying the Food Systems for the Future is an initiative that we began in 2019 to create the enabling environment that would support the opportunity for businesses, market-based businesses, to create access to nutritious foods for underserved and, um, and, and, and lower income communities. And the reality is we often talk about new programs. We don't talk about creating new businesses that can create economic opportunity as well as access to affordable nutritious food. And that, so that was why we wanted to fill that gap. And that was why we stood up the food systems for the future. So what will it take? We need a food system that can provide, and that is from farm to fork that provides uh, health uh, uh, access to healthy food, healthy for people and for the planet that also provides the financial support for all the actors, the and adequate financial support for all the actors from farm to fork. If we can create a system that a dynamic circular system that supports that type 
of food access, we begin the journey for ending hunger. But that does not eliminate the need for also social safety net programs for people who fall through the cracks of that system to ensure that they also have access to nutritious food. And to your question of how do we end food waste and begin to ensure that we don't, we don't dispose of food that could otherwise be consumed. I, it also requires an education program. We need to change the attitude of every eater in the world about what we consume. The, particularly here in places like the United States and Europe and, and, and other de, what we call developed countries, because too often, if food isn't pretty, we don't eat it. How often do we, we in the retail food industry, Sonny, that food is not, is, is not put on the shelf? The produce isn't put on the shelf because it's not a perfect apple. It's not a, a banana of a certain size. Having spent time in the retail food industry, we recognize that we lose so much food at the port because it is rejected. And so creating opportunities for new businesses to capture that food and to develop, to provide um, the mechanism for that food to then be consumed either through the market system or through the philanthropic system is quite important to us achieving a, 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 a system where no food is wasted. You ask, why do I believe this is important? I've had the opportunity throughout my career to work in the retail food industry, to work in the philanthropic food side here in the United States as executive vice president of feeding what is now Feeding America, to serve as the US ambassador for food and agriculture, representing the United States on issues related to how do we grow more food around the globe, and then to serve as the executive director of the World Food Program, feeding some 80 million people a year in 85 countries around the world. And what I am committed to for the balance of the time that I have on this earth is ensuring that every child has the ability to live their life to their full potential. And that means beginning with accessing the necessary food that they need to ensure that no child is malnourished in those first thousand days. Uh, Sonny just talked about, we still have 150 million children who are around the globe who are, who are chronically malnourished because they miss the opportunity for the nourishment that they need during that first thousand days. And we, as a global community, with a commitment to building a food system that supports a healthier planet as well as healthier people and eliminates waste and provides access to economic opportunity across that entire food system is the beginning for achieving that goal. Arthur, thank you so much. Um, I think to your point, right, in the wake of COVID-19 um, and its economic impacts, we are seeing an urgency to direct as much food as possible to its highest purpose, which is feeding people. Um, Alex and Alexis, I'm curious to learn from, from you both. Alex, I know that you launched the Refed Insights engine earlier this year, and I'm wondering if maybe you could tell us about what you're seeing in the capital and innovation landscape and maybe some of the trends um, that you could share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think just kind of jumping off a little bit of what we've been hearing so far, um, one of the important roles that I think Refed itself plays in this system in terms of creating a more sustainable, resilient, and inclusive food system is first and foremost, putting that data and insights into the space that therefore, going back to something Sunny said, people can start asking the right questions and start to poke and prod in the right areas and start to put money and innovation um, towards the areas of biggest need and the biggest white space and starting to fill these gaps. So um, back in February, just a little over a month ago, um, Refed released what we're calling our Refed Insights Engine and Roadmap to 2030. Um, our anchor funder, of course, was the Kroger Co Zero Hunger Zero Waste Foundation, along with other funders that were involved and which we are very grateful for. Um, but essentially this Insights Engine and Roadmap that we're able, we were able to launch, you know, we talk about this grand vision of how we're gonna get to a world with zero hunger and zero waste. 
you know, when I stop to think about it, to be perfectly frank, it's a bit frightening, right? How the heck are we going to get to that end space? Doesn't mean we shouldn't dream it, but we really need to start putting a plan in place, starting to take step by step to get us there. And fortunately, through the analysis that ReFed was able to do, um, we were able to demonstrate that at least through the adoption and scaling of 40 solutions that our organization did an extensive economic analysis for, we could get 50% of the way there. So reaching the national and global goal to reduce food loss and waste by 2030. Um, super exciting because at the same time as we're able to kind of meet that goal, what we're talking about are huge societal financial benefits to the tune of $70 billion annually. Um, and along with that, you know, not just the dollars um, that maybe consumers are saving or businesses are saving, we're talking about four trillion gallons of water being saved that right now is just going to waste in our system. We're talking about four billion more meals every year for people in need. So there's huge co-benefits that um, came through our analysis and that I think, you know, hopefully are helping um, stakeholders across the food system, whether you are a capital provider, whether you are a food business, whether you are an innovator, a policymaker, start to understand the unique role that you can play in trying to get us towards this world with zero hunger, zero waste. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, the 40 solutions that we analyzed, these are solutions and innovations that are already out there in the space. They're existing today. They're ready to go. Yes, they maybe need certain types of capital because each, you know, business model innovation maybe requires um, a unique mix of capital. Um, but that, that will get us part of the way there. But what we also recognize is that sometimes there are challenges or current barriers to existing solutions. And so that's where we need further innovation. That's why um, open calls like the one that Village Capital and the Kroger Co Zero Hunger Zero Waste Foundation are putting out right now are so powerful um, because there is great work that's being done today, but that doesn't mean the job is done. Um, and additionally, on the capital side, in particular, um, we did a financial analysis that showed that we need about $14 billion a year for the next 10 years to come into the space. And that's across public, private and uh, philanthropic capital to really get us to meet this goal of, you know, reducing hunger, fighting climate change, creating economic development through jobs creation, a more equitable and, and diverse food system. Um, and the biggest insights there are that Ultimate food businesses, the adopters of solutions, um, really need to step up to the plate to the tune of about $7 billion in terms of capital from corporate finance and spending. Um, but also there's a huge role for catalytic capital. So go back to that philanthropic side of the you know, asset class. We really believe that catalytic capital types like grants and impact first investments can really start to reduce risks in the space, help innovators and solution providers overcome barriers and ultimately bring more market based capital that is looking for that standard ROI into the space. Um, so you can tell that I'm super animated about this topic. To me, what motivates me about working on this is that there's a lot of challenges to our time that we're living in. Let's talk about COVID. Let's talk about equity. Divert, like, let's talk about all those things. But Food waste seems approachable, right? It seems like we can really solve it. And hopefully ReFed is playing a role in helping people understand what that roadmap is. And the great organizations on this line are doing their, their part as well. And hopefully others that are listening to the call today, so. Alex, I like that you said food waste seems approachable. Um, I don't know that everybody <laughs> agrees with that, but I, 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 hope that, I hope that that's true. Um, Alexis, I'd love to hear from you. I know from your perspective, um, in your experience, maybe what some of the gaps and opportunities are that you're seeing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an outsider in this group. Um, having not been uh, in, the, in the food industry in my career, I come from the entertainment um, space and music space, having uh, been a manager for Questlove for almost um, 14 years at this point. We started to invest in the food, kind of future of food, food 2.0 space, as we call it, about six years ago, um, for the same reasons that everybody on this in this conversation is, is involved in the space, um, wanting to uh, invest in companies that were providing more nutritious foods to more people, and foods that were better for humans and, and better for the planet, which is which is definitely closely tied to this issue around uh, zero waste and food loss and food waste. You know, we're, we've invested in a, a number of companies um, who are tackling issues on all sides of, of food waste and food access, um, covering many of the topics that, that everyone has already discussed from you know, companies like Appeal who are developing 
plant-based technologies to prolong the life of fruits and vegetables, which is a, a huge, um, th there is a huge benefit to that, both in combating food access and, and, food, and food waste, um, to companies that are inputting technology into the food industry that has long suffered of, of sort of being this archaic industry that um, is a global industry. And you know, what our, our food system doesn't just uh, mean what our, what our crops are in, in our country, but globally. Um, and so a company called Grow Intelligence that we recently invested in has brought AI technology to, uh, to farming and to agriculture to help uh, predict uh, crop yields and predictive modeling to, uh, you know, uh, put capital into the agriculture industry that has long um, suffered from being able to have that access to capital and and deploying capital into into the farming industry. I think is is actually really where it starts. You have to be able to um, give farmers an opportunity to get insurance policies, to purchase mis machinery, um, to get bank loans. And we still live in a system where all of that data and all of that information is not in the digital space. And, and, and we need it to be in the digital space quickly. And, I, and from the farm really to, um, you know, to fork in the sense that we have to use data and technology to be able to even deploy uh, food that surplus food to organizations that need it. I remember when COVID first started, we had um, we were both Questlove and I are both on the board of the Food Education Fund, uh, which is a population of students that are either living in low income housing or transitory housing that um, are really energized to come to school to get a meal and have been at home. Um, ha having a lot of food insecurity issues. And we, over the last 12 months, have been working week to week getting these kids uh, access to food. And just the organization of even deploying food to one school, let alone um, the work that, uh, you know, Jose uh, Andres is doing with his organization, World Frontiers Forum, or what Feeding America has done. It is, it is really a very challenging task um, to be able to just move food from a place where it is rotting or, or soon to be rotting to a place where it can be consumed. And so on the capital side, investing in, um, in companies that are, are providing platforms uh, where the, far, the agriculture industry can use data, and this is happening all over the world, it's there's a, there's several companies in Israel that are emerging um, around uh, you know providing um, data resources to banks, to insurance companies, to machinery companies um, that can use that predictive modeling to be able to support the farming industry. And it's got to happen in supply chain. It's got to happen in distribution. It's got to happen in transportation. Um, and, and, and so that's where I see really the opportunity is, is to be able to bring technology into the food industry that is, is main focus and main purpose is around food waste. Mm -hmm. You know, Kelly, Kelly, if I can come in for a moment, please. Absolutely. And, and just say, and, and it's so interesting listening to all of you. And just to point out that the companies that we are focusing on at FSF are, are, are companies that can be described, uh, meet the descriptions that both Alexis and Alexandria talked about. But we are particularly looking in what we call the messy middle, that place where there's lots of new tools coming on with incubators and accelerators, prizes, uh, and and then there's the commercial capital. There's that space in the middle after you've graduated though from those programs, and yet you are not ready for commercial investment for the traditional VCs that particularly 
Black and Latinx companies have found thorny and unable to and unable to work through that period. That's the places where FSF is working to identify those founders that have the capacity and have the proven ability to create the nutrition impact and also the a viable financial return. And we need to think about the fact that in order for us to achieve the goals we've all been talking about here, we need to recognize that we can't just uh, do what we've always done and hope to achieve a different result. Yes, Arthur, and thank you so much for breaking that up. I, Sunny, in the beginning, you know, was talking about the need to bring the right voices into the room and different voices into the room. Um, I wonder though, how do you do that? Is that a challenge that you're seeing? How do we bring the right people into the room? How do we deploy capital uh, to those people in a way that's actually going to support uh, support their their mission and what they're doing? Um, Sunny, Earthrin, I'm curious what you both think about that. Well, Arthur and just spoke to incredible examples, right? And I think all of us represent kind of um, that catalytic capital that Alexandria, you know, brought up. And I love this messy middle. Like you're targeting exactly a gap that's needed. And um, unless we go out to do those um, specific visions of identifying gaps using data and insights, right, to to make sure where our place is, and we're all uniquely placed. And we're all uniquely supposed to do a specific role, but we all have to come together in these types of like exciting conversations. Um, and, and then how do you continue to work harder to get, you know, get um, what you are doing, Earthrend, out to the world even more, right? And Alexis, like Rethink Food and all of the examples you gave and like all these things culminate to a lot of, uh, I, I hope they're getting after, um, hope is not the word we need right now, right? We need action. But, you know, they're getting after that $40 billion gap that, you know, uh, Alexandria and Refed have come after, you know, in, in regards to the data. Um, we have to think about, again, I'm just going to kind of wrap back to kind of my initial thoughts on all voices, the table we have set and who we invite and um, who gets a seat and who has a fork and a, you know, a knife and all the utensils to be able to enjoy the meal that is being served. Um, we get, we in our world, um, and I am so appreciative of this panel because we are like, thank you for doing this hard work. We just get more curious and we push ourselves further and we take more calculated risks and we fail more. With that though, we learn more, you know, that can better inform our journey to success and we use data and technology to accelerate that action. Um, and, we and we support that acceleration, right, Earthrend? Through capital, focus on, you know, exactly that messy middle of whatever it is that you're, you know, your, um, your, your specific directive is. Um, and again, ask the hard questions, right? Ask the hard questions around food justice, food equity as it relates to access. And in this conversation specifically access to that capital for those creative solutions and those lived experience that are being brought because they know um, the solutions, right? They, they've, they've gone through, um, through the challenges. Um, and we know, I mean, it's like super, the messy, I'm gonna stay in the messy middle, right? Cause mm -hmm. it does not, success does not look the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we have to bring all that we have. And I think that, you know, all looking at um, these fantastic women who are leading this work on this panel, like we have different strengths that we are bringing. And I think that's what is um, a part of the discussion and part of the celebration that I want to lift up today. Um, I would also that, say that- like, oh, Alexandria said something. Um, sorry, Alexis, one more thing. Um, yeah, food waste is approachable. It is solvable. And I, and I feel like if I can open my laptop every day and do this work, roll up my sleeves and say, um, this is something that data is getting after. This is something that really smart women are, on this panel are getting after. Um, that gives me a, a lot of, um, I'm gonna go back to hope. But, uh, and that is sometimes in our very uh, normal life and interesting times that we are living in. Um, that normalcy is what we need. 
And I, I would just say that I, I do, I believe in a world um, where there is zero food waste and it's possible. Go ahead, Alexis. I was just gonna say that um, I, I think a, a big piece of this as we think about you know, the next five years, 10 years, how we think about climate, some of the goals that corporate America is setting, that, that the UN is setting for how we will start to really put action to thinking differently is, you know, again, coming from outside the food space, one of the, the, the biggest things that I've observed in food is that it is a very insular community. Um, food is a big space. There are farmers, there are distributors, there are CPG brands, there are grocers and retail brands, but the food space itself is, is very close knit. Everyone sort of knows each other. Um, and I think as we think about solutions to um, eliminating hunger in our country, which needs to happen immediately, I mean, not, not 10 years in, in a year, in two years, um, or, or food waste. And now we think about food as nutrition, food as health, um, and, and, and the great climate risk that we face is really speaking to people outside of food, right? It's very hard to change the way that people eat, what they purchase, what they bring into their home, what they're open to. But I do think that, um, and what I'm seeing in the space is, you know, there's so much great technology and there are lots of great ideas. There's certainly this messy middle that you speak of and and certainly there needs to be more capital deployed to underrepresented founders um, that uh, don't have access, the, the same kind of access to that capital. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it, it is on the companies that are at the top, right? The, the Kroger's, the companies that are you know, merging food 2.0 companies that are, are now have crazy valuations of a billion dollars, $5 billion to speak to communities outside of their norm. Um, you know, when I looked into where Appeal, for instance, had their products in Philadelphia, where I live, um, which has a very large African-American population. And I thought, well, I have not seen an Appeal avocado in my Whole Foods or at Trader Joe's <laughs> or in my local you know, store up the street. Um, but where Appeal is, is in a, a shop right in West Philadelphia. Um, in fact, they're in five shop rights in West Philadelphia that are in predominantly African American neighborhoods. And I can tell you 100% that not one person in that store knows what Appeal is and knows what its function is. Um, and it's a great innovation, and there are lots of great innovations that exist where it's a one for one. You know, combating food waste doesn't mean buying something that's more expensive or buying something that um, took more capital to get to you, um, it, it, it is a one-for-one -one solution. And so I do think it is a huge responsibility that the, the, the food companies and the food and, and, the, and the founders at the top of that food chain, so to speak, have the responsibility to start to really think, you know, how do Combating food waste, eating healthy, nutritious foods is no longer this sort of 1%, you know, hippie, you know, dippy idea. It is, it is something that is crucial to the health of the planet and health of humans that needs to be a universal language. One thing I'll just add to that, Alexis, because this is, you know, we're talking about capital and innovation, absolutely believe that what, you know, something that really motivates me and has motivated me in my career is that I truly believe in the power of big business to make change. Um, I'm all for market-based approaches. I think that's a really sustainable way to drive action. Um, but I will also say that what I have come to, to find is that money talks. And if we're talking to capital providers, you know, and representing capital providers in the space to a certain extent, Capital providers have a lot of say in terms of what happens, right? You've seen a lot of um, in, uh, investor activists out there that are making real change within the businesses that they are investing in, demanding certain requirements around food waste reduction and measuring and other efforts. Um, where are those businesses that they're investing in uh, contributing to community, et cetera? And so I think, you know, yes, 
food businesses, yes, us individuals have to hold ourselves accountable, but we also protect, perhaps have a responsibility to hold others accountable as well. And thinking about when we are investing our money in a certain solution or a certain innovation or a certain community, asking the right questions to make sure that we're pushing others to think about the equity, the inclusiveness of their solution or the work that they're doing. I find that us as a nonprofit, our most advanced funders are asking us those questions. What are you guys doing in certain areas to really expand the, um, the work that you're doing and to think about this in a new way. So just want to throw that out there too, because um, I think you know it's really a powerful position that capital providers have to really drive the system that we want to see. You're absolutely right. Well, we are now doing an event with Appeal in West Philadelphia because of, of this um, this information. So you're you're 100 percent right. Again, and I just want to chime in and say I am so honored to listen to all of you today because I everything you say I go uh huh that's exactly what I think. But no, very seriously, one of the game changers that's coming out of the UN Food System Summit, uh, speaking to what you just said, Alexandra, is a new one trillion dollar fund for food waste that driving that, I know you'd like that, Sonny, uh, to driving that as an initiative because yes, we do need consumer behavior change. Yes, we do need big business, but if we don't get the capital behind those initiatives, those businesses, that behavior change that is necessary, we won't drive the change we all desire to see. And so is at the base of this is capital, capital alone cannot change it, but it is definitely required as a pillar of the solution. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This has been fascinating for me to listen to, and I hope it's also been um, useful for our listeners to listen to as well. Um, I want to say thank you for not giving us the shiny and perfect version of what it looks like to support innovation for a sustainable food system, um, it, it is messy. We are working in the messy middle. Um, and, and to reiterate, right, as we think about solutions to eliminate hunger and food waste, we do need to speak to communities outside of food, uh, deploy capital to underrepresented founders, and to offer continued support uh, to innovative ideas, including capital, right? So um, those are the key takeaways for me. This has been a, a really great session. I really appreciate your insight. Thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you to the audience for, for joining us today as well. Um, as we wrap up, um, please join us for part two of this discussion to hear from several leading innovators uh, who are tackling food waste and doing the work to build a more sustainable food system. So we invite, invite all you audience members to join us for part two of the discussion. And thank you uh, for, for all the panelists here for your contributions and your insights. We really appreciate it. Welcome to part two of this session. Um, thank you to our audience members for joining us here uh, to talk about and with the innovators who are doing the work here to build a sustainable food system. Um, we are we're excited to dive into this part of the discussion, right? We have several innovators on the line who are tackling food waste and doing the work to build a more sustainable food system. So I would like to start by introducing each of our panelists um, and, and then getting into the conversation. So uh, I'll start by introducing Laura Hearn, who is co-founder and CMO of Ripe Revival. We have Philip Ben, who is CEO of Imperfect Foods. We have Rihanna Lin, who is CEO of Journey Foods, and Tony Bova, co-founder and CEO of Movius. Thank you all for joining the conversation today. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, to get started, um, as we heard from our previous speakers, um, we can no longer afford to waste surplus food at any level in our food system, right? Um, innovators from around the country, including yourselves, are helping to reinvent the food system and recover and redistribute surplus food in our communities. Uh, it's incredibly important work. And I think uh, I'm excited to have you all share what you are doing and your perspectives. Um, so I'd like to open it up with a question here to the entire panel. Uh, so what would it take to create a world without hunger and without food waste and food loss? Um, and maybe more importantly, why is this problem important to you? Maybe Rihanna, do you wanna, you wanna kick us off? 
Absolutely. So, you know, oftentimes I really think about the fact that uh, food and agriculture technology is some of the biggest, most powerful industries in the world. At the same time, billions of people go hungry every single day uh, and, and many, many millions here in the United States. Uh, and it's, it's not just that we're not growing enough food. We have uh, plenty of uh, abundance and uh, lots of soil fertility around the world. Uh, and, and new innovations around like uh, indoor farming, for example, as well. Uh, I think that some of our biggest issues really are around uh, logistics and data. And so at Journey Foods, our focus is on making sure that we're saving companies a tremendous amount of time uh, and, and money on bringing food to, to billions of people every year. Uh, but one thing that's most evident is the fact that we need more innovators and more support collaboratively, publicly and privately uh, to fund the most pressing issues in the world. And so what's most exciting now is that more and more capital is, going, are, is being deployed to companies like ours. And we need to continue to find ways to press on it so that we can solve these issues much, much faster. There, there's really no reason why why food should both uh, be causing uh, a hunger issue and in, in gaps, as well as also uh, some of really the, the leading cause of chronic disease or, or across the world. Uh, so uh, I think um, this is such a great issue and, and happy to dive in more on how data uh, and, and sort of venture support can help solve this, but uh, happy to be here and share those thoughts. I'm always curious to hear from innovators as to why why this problem is personal for you. Like, why are you dedicating so much time and energy to solve solve this problem? I would love to to answer that. Just my personal perspective. My background began in agriculture, and I had the privilege to work with um, over 40 family farms and growers who were growing sweet potatoes, and just really saw firsthand all these crops that they either had to discard or leave in the field just because of odd shape or size or color defects. Um, and so I, I'm very personally passionate about these farmers who are, are striving to feed the world, but um, just the great need for education and awareness on all levels for people to, to understand that a, a funny shaped uh, fruit or vegetable still is perfectly delicious and nutritious. And I just think being able to educate and bring that awareness uh, to the surface and help foster the ecosystem of, of innovation, people that um, become passionate about finding solutions is there's a lot of work that can be done there and, and having organizations like what Kroger has done uh, really, you know, commit from the top down to making an impact and then supporting innovators. Um, all the way through. Yeah, what, what I would add to that, um, Kelly, is um, food waste accounts for about a quarter of greenhouse emissions. So those of us who care about the planet and the kind of planet we want to leave to our, our children and the future generations, um, it, it's just such a resource intensive um, sector in industry. Um, imagine the amount of water that flows into the farms that feed us, the fertilizer, the labor that goes in, the acreage that, you know, needs to be destined for agricultural purposes as opposed to being in woodland or marshes or other things. It's just incredibly um, intensive in the use of resources and therefore such a big component of, of the emissions um, and the overall um, demands on the planet. So, with innovation, I think as 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 Rihanna and um, and Laura were saying, and capitalization of these businesses that are trying to do something about this, we can change the whole production function um, in, in in this area that really hasn't changed for hundreds of years. Um, it's gotten a little bit better with sort of genetic technologies and things like that that are not necessarily the most popular ones, but it hasn't really changed as other parts of the industry have. Thank you, Philip, for that insight. Um, I, I, startups are uniquely positioned to play a critical role, right, in creating a world with zero hunger and zero waste, uh, particularly in a post-pandemic world. Um, so, Tony, I'm kind of curious to learn a little from you about, as the founder and CEO of Mobius, what has your experience been like as an entrepreneur, and has it changed at all uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the big things that we take a viewpoint on at Movius is that uh, we see the food system as a key and integral part of the circular economy. Um, knowing that while there's great entrepreneurs working on technologies for extending shelf life, uh, for food rescue operations, or even processing you know, some ugly fruits and veggies into snacks that can be eaten, there's still over 250 million tons of food waste that's unavoidable, things like fruit peels, distillers grains, um, yeah, waste cooking oil. And that's a huge burden on our food system, on the retailers. And the pandemic has kind of borne that out even more. Um, we personally, as a company, are focused on developing technologies that can remediate that and turn those waste streams into chemicals and materials. Uh, so back in March of 2020, we had to make the decision to kind of stop all of our laboratory R&D operations. So no more research to make these new technologies, um, just because it wasn't safe for us to be together. We actually had a great opportunity though, with the support of the Kroger Zero Hunger Zero Waste Foundation uh, to dive deep on like what a big technology roadmap might be for solving some of these unavoidable food waste challenges and helping lift that burden off of the growers, the processors and the retailers that are kind of a pivotal part and frontline workers now um, in our society. And so we used that support from Kroger and we developed a big database where we've identified over 215 different fruit and veg, dairy products, um, and over 148 million tons of waste opportunity. Uh, and now we're ready to work with other entrepreneurs um, to kind of double down on this problem. So I think, you know, if it's food waste or even seeing things like masks and gloves from, from the pandemic, the, the idea of being more efficient and not wasting in a time of need has really brought that front and center for, for me personally as an entrepreneur during this pandemic. It's good to hear. Uh, in our last conversation with with some of the you know investors uh, in this space, it, it was a, an acknowledgement that there is a need above and beyond just capital to support innovation, right? Um, I'm wondering if you all, as innovators, can kind of speak to what that support is and what that looks like, either in in a successful way or really what um, is a, is a challenge when we're talking about support above and beyond just capital. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. You know, for Journey Foods, uh, we really aim to, to provide one of the most actionable databases for food companies uh, available around the world that can really fight sustainability uh, and, and overall nutrition within food. And for us, we've really found that uh, government partnerships, as well as partnerships with uh, large global supply chain providers, has really accelerated our growth. Uh, you know, there are a lot of mission-driven companies that have tried to solve hunger and uh, you know, wellness and other food systems issues for, for many decades. Uh, but at the end of the day, it wasn't until probably the past five years that like venture capital really went into like food and ag tech to really accelerate the, the impact. But also uh, what, what I find is if you do not dive into like very serious logistics, R&D, scientific, you know, data issues, even if you have that mission alignment, then you can't really move the needle that much. Uh, and so that's why I truly believe that, you know, partnerships with, you know, large global organizations, whether they be retailers or software providers, as well as uh, uh, more public government entities that uh, also provide lots of key data uh, is, is how we can remove ourselves from just needing capital and find ways to to grow and move the needle as well. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I think a lot of these problems are really complex and sort of multi-stakeholder and, and sometimes governments either at a state or federal level play an important part. If you've, if you've um, followed the news about what, what happened, for example, in the grocery sector in France where the government basically determined that uh, food could not be just dumped at the end of the day and it had to be processed or it had to be, uh, you know, shared with food banks and uh, that triggered a whole new wave of building supply chains or parts of the supply chains that just didn't exist. When, when we started in Perfect Foods back in 2015, there was no supply chain that moved ugly veggies from farms in the U.S. to big cities. Um, it just didn't exist. It was, it was a really sort of thing that we had to build from, from scratch. 
And similarly, in you know, as, as governments start to regulate and price some of these negative externalities around food waste and the impact that it has on society, but also on climate change, um, those supply chains are going to start to be developed, um, which is which is really badly needed for for the problem to to be solved in the long term. I think one additional thing um, that I'll definitely echo the sentiments of both of my fellow entrepreneurs is that uh, partnership with bigger organizations who kind of have the clout to make big swings while we're small companies who have very dedicated teams but limited resources um, can come when we have an opportunity to find internal champions at those organizations. So if there's one person in those big companies that can help open up the door um, for us to be able to teach them at like the corporate level or otherwise that uh, we're here in the business to turn liabilities into opportunities, then that can kind of change the way that their ethos is around uh, things like, you know, throwing away food at the end of the day that could be donated or having something that's a waste stream or just understanding that other people want to help them, you know, kind of capitalize on the data that exists in the world and find the right solutions that just improve all of this. Um, as you know, kind of a, a unified force. You know, the, the saying that a, a rising tide raises all boats. So I, I think that working together and um, getting those internal people to kind of help you open the door as an entrepreneur into a, a bigger food system problem uh, is super key. And it, it's not really a money issue, it's just attention and time. Yeah, absolutely, Tony. Like stakeholders that are really trying to drive innovation and uh, think beyond the traditions of the food industry that have been sort of slow moving on innovation as well as uh, just the proprietary nature of the food industry, especially with bigger organizations. I mean, uh, it's a little bit scary, but as like fintech and financial industry is changing pretty rapidly with, with connections and partnerships, I think you're going to start to see that more in the food industry. But there's definitely companies that have internal stakeholders that are driving more innovation and partnership. And, and I, I absolutely agree with you, Tony. Brianna, I kind of want to stick with you for a second. Um, you're deeply rooted in like communities and families, right? And like, it seems like keenly aware of, of how an inefficient food system directly negatively impacts communities and families. So I'm, I'm curious to learn from you um, if you could share maybe some of the greatest problems in our food systems that you're seeing affecting um, people within our own communities and our families. Well, I mean, definitely, as I mentioned earlier, there's, and I don't know that the latest numbers, but I would say probably more than 70 million people. Uh, it was it was close to 50 million before going hungry every single day in the United States. I can imagine that that number has jumped quite significantly here as we've seen uh, an abundance of issues around uh, management of, uh, of every, in almost every city of like dispersing foods uh, through, through different uh, nonprofits and, and organizations to help with uh, shortage of daily hunger. But another issue that's uh, quite pressing is the fact that, and, and Philip, Philip mentioned this as well with uh, a lot of deleterious effects on the environment, which have downstream effects on every single human being. But what's interesting for me to pay attention to is the fact that, um, you know, while not every single person goes hungry, especially associated with different socioeconomic groups, every single food product uh, or almost every single food product that we're putting into our bodies um, in some ways because of uh, inefficiencies in the supply chain, inefficiencies in just the fact that us humans have to keep up with feeding you know, more than 300 million people in the US, more than 8 billion people coming up over the next decade, uh, is that the food that we eat are just not, is not good for our bodies. And we've tried to turn that food into convenience foods, into grocery store uh, level food and, uh, you know, imperfect foods or ripe revival, uh, doing a great job of bringing whole foods to, to consumers. But at the same time, we're moving into a direction where we're using food waste and turning it into packaged foods and turning it into beverages. And, and that's just the the way of, of the world because of our overall population growth. And I think um, as we understand how to make food manufacturing more efficient, we can also turn back the, the dial and, and make it more nutritious and, and more beneficial to the environment as well. 
Laura, this is definitely in your space, right? I would love to hear from you. Um, you've made it your mission to use farmers' excess uh, food to create healthy food for consumers, right? So I'm curious if you could maybe share what the impact at scale looks like at Ripe, Revo Ripe Revival and who who's benefiting from, from your innovative solution. Yeah, this is, I mean, this truly is, is the passion that Ripe Revival was built on. Um, my brother is my co-founder and he and I both worked in fresh produce and just started seeing this the waste problem and thought there's got to be a way to bridge this gap between excess and access to food. And so our company was really built to feed both ends of these problems. Um, we have a, a proprietary technology that allows us to use upcycled fruit and fruits and vegetables, but also even stuff that would have been considered waste. So like pomace and things left over from juicing, we still can pull the remaining nutrition and good stuff out of, out of that. So just looking at what waste is and trying to redefine that as things that have more life. Um, and we also have a give back element of, as a consumer packaged goods company, we, we do have a consumer facing product and for every purchase, we are committed to donating fresh foods um, to those in need. And just growing up in a home where we always had access to food and a shared meal around the table was, you know, an experience that uh, was just foundational to our upbringing. We believe that everyone should have access to that. Um, and so at scale for us, we make fruit and vegetable gummies and some other products and we're able to utilize 10 pounds of upcycled produce for every one pound of, of gummies alone that we make. And in the past 12 months alone, we've been able to utilize 4 million pounds of fruits and vegetables that would have typically been discarded or left in the field. Um, and so as we continue to scale, that, that will just be compounded. Um, and we see the beneficiaries in like three main groups. We're able to partner with farmers. So we are able to help them find a profitable home for some of these excess crops. Um, we also benefit consumers because we're, we are providing the nutritious and better for you foods um, in a shelf stable, easy to eat on the go format. And then of course, just our community partners and the people that we're able to, to pro provide foods to, um, they're, they're extreme beneficiaries. And so as we continue to scale, we're able to kind of full circle bridge that gap between excess foods and access to health. Yeah, Philip, with your with your background here, I'm, I'm interested to learn a little bit more from you as to what you see as the role of startups in disruption um, within the food system um, and, and uh, what your thoughts are on on their role on this on the role of innovation in general. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, um... As it was said earlier in the panel, big corporations also have a meaningful role to play. I would say startups have the benefit of speed and large corporations have the benefit of scale. And uh, unfortunately, those two things don't always overlap. So I'm encouraged to see things like the Kroger Zero, Hunger Zero Waste um, efforts to connect with businesses that are more nimble than potentially the mothership uh, and can bring that kind of innovation uh, into the system. Uh, I see other retailers doing that as well, and that gives me hope. Um, I, I don't think that it would be possible for the incumbents to change uh, quickly without startup and entrepreneurial activity that rocks the boat and comes up with disruptive uh, concepts, um, but it really needs to be disruptive. Um, I mean, one of the things that helped us grow uh, and, and, and therefore improve our footprint is not only did we upcycle food and make that available to customers, but we do th did that for 30 or 40 percent less um, cost to the customer. Um, so it, there's always a risk that some of these innovative ideas end up coming into the market at a premium price. And if that's the case, then you don't really change the behavior and you don't do much for access. Um, and, and that's that's a risk. So you have to find ways to be disruptive um, with a sort of low price proposition, make it eliminate the trade-offs between people who want to do the right thing for the planet, but can't afford to. Um, and I think that's the biggest unlock where startups can lead the way. And then hopefully large corporations will see that it's possible and then um, benefit with, you know, benefit the market with their scale. 
So Philip, when you say you want to, this concept of eliminating the trade-off for people who want to do the right thing for the planet, but can't afford it, are you talking yeah. in that circumstance, mostly consumers? So the buyer at the end, yeah. like who, who is it that you're talking about? Yeah, so we, we, in our business, we serve consumers primarily. And what we see is uh, people everywhere in the country, this is not a phenomenon constrained to like the, what people would call the coastal sort of well-educated people who are greener than, than the rest. It's actually not true. We see the same kind of, uh, you know, hunger for doing something about the planet, for eliminating food waste, for working on food access and food fairness uh, anywhere in the country. The difference is the purchasing power. Um, and the difference is also the offer that people have. Um, you know, sometimes you're stuck in a place where your only option is a large supermarket or an even larger hypermarket. Um, and, and none of those offer you an ability to contribute to this problem by buying something that's upcycled. It's just, it's not offered there. So I think by going into new markets, encouraging local innovation, you know, helping startups, you know, with their own services or farmers markets, just changing the mix um, so that we go back to something that feels more local, um, is more affordable and, um, and, and, you know, enable some of these new supply chains we were talking about earlier, right? So moving things from, from farms to remote places where traditional supermarkets just have, have neglected that, that piece of the, uh, of the production that, is, uh, that comes out of farms and growers. Yeah, what I, what I feel like I'm hearing is that the onus is not on one group of people to create systems level change and really to end hunger and, and, and waste. And of course, we know that, but um, you know, the consumer and the purchasing power of, is, of course, important, but everybody in the ecosystem plays a really critical role. Investors, experts, stakeholders, startups, consumers. Um, so I think the concept of bringing the ecosystem together seems to be a theme here. And I'm curious what you all think uh, about that need for maybe integration throughout the food system. And I can jump in there because uh, at Dream Foods, we, we have dozens of integrations and we're looking for more partnerships every single day. I think it's really key, not only to software growth and data growth, but it's, it's, growth, uh, it's key to growth uh, within the industry. And so uh, I think every company needs to take a, a step back and think about their partnership and integration plan at the beginning of every year and, and really uh, sort of let go of the, the notion that like you have to be this insular sort of silo of innovation uh, and, and, and be the first to market when uh, today between artificial intelligence, between uh, you know, larger uh, global organizations that are partnering where you see like, for example, like a Beyond Meat with a McDonald's or a PepsiCo, right? We're going to have to really just embrace that uh, partnerships and, and, and innovation uh, jointly is the way of the future. And I think everyone should be open to those conversations. Tony, I'm curious what you think about, about maybe what's currently challenging from an ecosystem perspective, what works well and maybe what doesn't. Yeah, so I would say one of the biggest challenges is getting beyond, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, that first introduction with somebody who could be uh, at a supply chain partner, at a retailer, at a grower, somebody within the ecosystem that can actually benefit you. Um, I found that like, Going to conferences, uh, participating in events like this is a really great opportunity to have those collisions with people who um, recognize that it's part of their job if they're focused and mission driven on sustainability to, to meet entrepreneurs. Um, but the hard part continues to be once you have that, like how do you as a small company know how to work with a bigger organization or more often than not, how do they know how to work with a small company? Um, you know, what's a meaningful type of project slash pilot or something that is not something that is asking the entrepreneur to come up with like a million dollar rollout for something, but is meaningful enough for the bigger organization to say like, yeah, this is worth our time and effort. Philip, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know with your background at Walmart, right? Like, you know, and understand what it looks like at a larger corporation and also what it looks like at an earlier stage uh, company. So 
what are your thoughts on on that dynamic or maybe that power dynamic at play? Yeah, I mean, I I think you know every every company is is good at what they do, and 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 you know a lot of the uh, retail the generation of retailers that you see own the lion's share of the market today uh, were started fifty to a hundred years ago, um, and as a result of that, you know they have pretty embedded processes and assets all over the place and supply chains that they have built over many, many years that are incredibly efficient and good at what they do, um, but they find it difficult to change uh, and change quickly. Um, and, and some of the uh, products that we're talking about, I mean, I can speak to what, what we do for a living, which is, again, moving sort of ugly fruits and veggies from farms to, to table. Um, those ugly fruits and veggies don't travel that well. They, they don't survive for you know, 25 days in a cold supply chain, um, which is the way that traditional industrial supply chains work. Again, very efficient, uh, cost effective, but not good for things that are not in the norm or not within the norm. So I think uh, the, the reason they know they have to do something about it, but I can't is because they have so much legacy. Um, and and, and it's, it's hard to, it's sort of the, the innovate, they call the innovator's dilemma, right? So even if there is a disruptive technology that you love, your core business is so large and, 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 and such a big chunk of the expectation of delivering profits and you know, revenue and things like that, that it doesn't allow you to really invest in that promising new technology, which is why I think uh, startups are part of the answer here and, and the capital and the expertise that is flowing into innovation and startups. Um, and one or more of those startups are going to become very large. And who knows who's going to dominate the next 100 years of retail? Um, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be uh, everyone that you see out there in the, in, on Main Street. Yeah, Laura, I just keep coming back to what you said earlier, which is we need to bridge, bridge the gap between excess and access, right? And I think that that speaks volumes to our issues in our in our food system, both around food waste and, and with hunger and access to healthy food within our communities. Um, as we wrap up, I, I'm thinking about the listeners, right? The people who are who are tuning into this conversation. I imagine there are innovators. I imagine there are investors, stakeholders, experts, but maybe consumers as well. Um, I wonder if, if you all, all have a call to action or a, an, an ask from the listeners here today. I think my main ask, especially for people that are budding innovators or entrepreneurs, um, I, by nature, was not an entrepreneur, but just had this burning passion to make a difference. And so just really listening to what that is and being interested and hungry to learn more um, because through that you get to interact with people like this that are just incredible, incredibly gifted and passionate people. And um, no matter what, you know, you have nothing to lose by trying uh, to learn more and um, it might start small and it might amount to something very large. So I think whatever it is that is your burning passion on the issue of waste or um, hunger to just keep doing the research and, and learning more and talking with people and, and learning from them. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, what, one, one, one encouraging thing about food waste and, and this problem is that we can all do something about it at home, right? So about 20% of the food that ends up in landfill is because we don't use it uh, on time. It goes bad in our own refrigerators and pantries or uh, we don't know how to, how to cook the whole thing, so we cook 75% of it, which is the part we understand, and the other 25% goes in, into landfill. Um, so educating uh, ourselves about what we can do at home to cook scraps or to make soups and things like that um, that could increase your own yield of the things that you buy every week so that less of that goes to waste. That's something that each one and every one of us can do. I'd also want to add that um, thinking about the mindset and things that you make decisions on rather than being like a black or white, uh, I can do this or I can do that. There's usually a happy medium, like there's an and component. Um, as innovators, I think that it's our job to think of how we can do multiple things at the same time. Um, and I, I always encourage people to think of the, how do we do multiple things at once and be more efficient, whether it's like Philip just gave a great example of something in your home. How do I 
make a great stir fry with my leftovers from the, you know, uh, call it ratatouille that I made the other night. Or if you're an innovator, like how do I build a company and at the same time be giving back to my community um, in a way that is mutually beneficial? Yeah, just quickly, I want to say uh, at Journey Foods, we really think about the full portfolio. So uh, even at home, think about how you're using packaging and in ordering, because in the past year, I mean, that has had a reverse effects as, as we've grown to ship and order way more into our homes. And so packaging is, is really an important key here. And finally, uh, to agree with my fellow, my fellow panelists, um, every bit of accountability and questioning matters for every company of all sizes. And so you can show up, whether it be a tweet or, or a bot chat uh, on the company website, uh, make your voice heard, share your thoughts. And that definitely moves the needle. Even if there's no direct feedback loop, uh, eventually a lot of your voice will, will pass through the supply chain and, and those changes will be made. And thank you so much everybody for your input there. Um, what I'm hearing and what I love, Philip, you said is we can do something about this, right? And Rihanna, that every bit of accountability matters um, and to make your voice heard. I hope that everybody heard that loud and clear. Um, what I've also heard is that startups, capital, expertise, buyers, we, we at home, all of us, we're all critical to systems level change. Um, uh, but I also want to say thank you to all of you innovators who are, who are doing the work um, uh, where we, um, we value what you're doing so much and, and hope to continue to support uh, your important work. So thank you all to the panelists for joining today for your contributions. Um, and thank you all to the listeners here. Uh, we hope you've come away with some nuggets of information that can be helpful to you. Um, if you'd like to learn more uh, about each of these panelists today, please visit the South by Southwest website for more information. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about what you can do to support initiatives that create communities free of hunger and waste, please visit zerohungerzerowastefoundation.org. And finally, the Kroger Co. Zero Hunger Zero Waste Foundation Innovation Fund uh, just launched their second open call for applications. So if you are an innovator listening in with a solution to prevent food waste, we encourage you to learn more about this year's challenge and apply at zerohungerzerowastefoundation.org. A reminder that applications close April 1st. So with that, thank you all for participating. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks so much.